So, as Andrew said at the start, uh, we had to put a little red cross uh, through the title of, the, of this session. Um, but worry not, um, I'll sort of explain why that was. So, as you know, we get some audience requests in uh, for, for topics. Um, and I think months and months ago, we had a request for liberty protection safeguards. Um, and I think at the time it was booked and we scheduled this webinar, they were due to be in place. Um, it was all supposed to happen really back in 2019. Um, and I will talk through some of the timeline and some of the implications of that. Um, but the last kind of formal update was that LPS would not be implemented in this current sitting of Parliament. Um, so it's going to be pushed back until at least 2025. Um, so if you are UK based, you'll know that a general election here needs to be held by the end of January. Um, but it's kind of predicting that it's going to be late 2024. So at the minute, the fate of LPS is up in the air. So I think initially, um, you know, this was going to really be about the main differences between LPS and dolls, which we'll be looking at as well. So I think, you know, if you've come along to this session hoping to learn about LPS, I still think you'll get a lot out of it. Um, because we'll just be talking about what is the, the current legislation, the current mechanism um, that is very much rooted within the Mental Capacity Act. That's not going to change either way. Um, so I'll talk you through a little bit of history about human rights, mental capacity, um, where we're up to with dolls and LPS. Um, and we'll just do a little review of the Mental Health Act versus the MCA. Um, so this session has been kind of adopted to have a bit more of a broader appeal. Um, I know we sometimes get quite a lot of international viewers. Again, just to make it clear, this is going to be very much UK centric legislation. Um, but I still think that you might get something out of this with some of the case studies that I, I hope bring um, what is quite a complex and dry piece of legislation to life. Um, so. Again, like I said, it, it does hang in the balance what's going to happen, um, you know, without speculating or putting any bets on. Um, it's perhaps looking more likely than not that we're going to have a Labour led government, um, in which case the LPS will likely be scrapped altogether because they actually voted against the 2019 amendment to the Mental Capacity Act, which is where this all came from. Um, a Conservative government, if they were to get in, will likely revisit, but you have to bear in mind that if they kind of look at this, the proposed changes will be six years old in 2025. And I think if they do manage to win a general election, it's not going to be their first priority. So I guess I just wanted you all to be aware, if you've come on here looking at how to change your practice, the official guidance is you do not, you stick with dolls, you stick with Mental Capacity Act. Um, so I've really minimised uh, the role of LPS in tonight's session. Um, I think by way of an introduction, I know I've got a lot of kind of regular viewers, but if you've not uh, can I seen me speak before? Do have a little look back at the the, the, the catalogue, as, as Andrew mentioned, through the app. Um, there's lots of webinars on there. Uh, my background is registered mental health nurse, um, I'm ACP. Um, my current sort of day job is, is as a senior lecturer in mental health nursing. Um, and I do do some expert witness work on the side as well. Um, and so that's really looking at perhaps where the law hasn't been properly applied or kind of where there's some liabilities and gaps in kind of breach and duty of care. Um, and my clinical experience has broadly been in liaison psychiatry. So I, I've had lots of experience of kind of utilizing the Mental Capacity Act and the Mental Health Act in kind of emergency hospital settings. So just wanted to set the scene with some of the legal context of medical ethics, healthcare ethics, um, that really underpin uh, our use of the Mental Capacity Act. So you're probably all familiar with these. I think it very much started as the, the, the founding medical ethics way back when, 
um, and they've been adopted into lots of professions, lots of healthcare professions, um, and certainly within kind of research healthcare ethics as well. And I think the ones that are of particular importance, um, excuse me, will be around autonomy, justice, but also beneficence and, and non-maleficence, which is do no harm and to do good. All of this really is steeped in the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, in particular, it's the kind of the right to liberty or Article 5, the right to not be unlawfully detained um, and the right to family and private life, which, of course, if we are talking about kind of deprivation, care home, we are absolutely, you know, uprooting people's whole life. So it's really important that we apply this legislation conscientiously, carefully and respectfully. So just, you know, to reiterate again, that liberty clause was really all about, you know, avoiding unlawful uh, detention, um, primarily focused on the criminal justice system. So, you know, all of us have got the right to go about our lives within the limit of the law. Um, but of course, as this legislation has been adopted, um, the, the liberty clause has been very, very relevant here. And like I said, private and family life, very important as well, especially if we're getting to that edge of the legislation where we're actively interfering in people's lives. So Mental Capacity Act, um, to make it very clear, the deprivation of liberty safeguards are the legal mechanism within the MCA. I think sometimes there can be a little bit of misunderstanding that dolls is a thing of its own or it's an act. It's really just a legal mechanism within this wider capacity act that we will be looking at. Um, and really that underpins all decisions that we make for people um, when they're unable to make that decision for themselves. Um, there's five key principles which underpin this act, and we'll do a little bit of a whistle-stop tour of them. And I think the important thing to note is that if the LPA, LPS does replace the dolls, it will still remain an integral part of the wider Mental Capacity Act. And I'll, I'll, at the end, I'll kind of highlight some of the proposed changes. They're really just around the bureaucracy and processes. So principle one is the presumption of capacity. Every single adult has the right to make their own decisions. And we also cannot assume that a person lacks capacity just because they've got a certain condition or a disability. Um, an important point in this is that the burden of proof lies with the health or social care professional who has the doubts over capacity. And we'll get into a bit more detail as to kind of what might trigger us to think about capacity and what that assessment might look like. Another really, really important principle within this kind of um, this ethical area is that capacity assessment is decision and time specific. Um, you assess capacity for different interventions, for different decisions that need to be made. Just because someone lacks capacity for one thing doesn't mean they lack capacity for other things. Um, and again, just because someone's got dementia, for example, doesn't mean we've got carte blanche to make every single decision for them. So quite often um, we'd get referrals through when I worked in mental health liaison and it would say kind of, you know, patient lacks capacity. Or come back to that would always be for what? You know, you can't just make that blanket statement. I suppose there will be times where, you know, care planning for people with advanced dementia, things that aren't going to get better, you're going to have a kind of a global amount of impaired capacity for making huge decisions. But I think, you know, even people with advanced dementia should be encouraged to participate in care. They're kind of respectfully treated. Their wishes are taken into consideration. So there's always ways that we can make care really person centred. The second principle is that individuals are supported. Um, so people must be given all practic practicable help before being treated as unable to make a decision. So, for example, if someone's got a learning disability, can that information uh, be presented in a more accessible way? Um, another key point is, can the decision be delayed? Is the incapacity only temporary? You know, are they acutely unwell? Are they intoxicated? We don't want to be rushing massive life-changing decisions 
when people are only kind of temporarily impaired. And I think language and culture is really important around that as well. Principle three um, is the right to make an unwise decision. Now, the interesting thing about a lot of these terms is that they don't actually have any legal definition. No one can turn around and say what an unwise decision actually looked like, but it's typically held that it wouldn't be something that we would advise or recommend as a healthcare professional. But nonetheless, if someone has capacity, they can make their own choices and we've got to respect that, that they, they're kind of free to do that. You know, in my background of being a, a clinician, I did a lot of work as a community mental health nurse and that involves supporting people in the community. And more often than not, you would work with people who would make a choice that you thought, look, that's quite silly. You know, maybe they would blow a lot of their income or benefits on drugs or make kind of unwise health choices. But I think as healthcare professionals, we see people make those unwise decisions every single day. It's just important that we don't automatically equate that with not having capacity. Principle four is the principle of best interests. Whatever we do for someone, if we're making an action or a decision on someone else's behalf, we've got to do that in their best interest. And we'll look at that concept in a wee bit more detail um, just shortly. Um, the fifth principle um, is that whatever we do should be the least restrictive. Um, we would weigh that up on a case by case basis. And really what that amounts to is that whatever you are suggesting, whatever you want to do for someone should have the least amount of disruption or interference. Um, a really common one that you would see in a kind of discharge from hospital setting is, you know, trying to get someone back home with a robust package of care even though carers coming in four times a day is still quite invasive, it's a hell of a lot less invasive than placing someone, you know, out of their home into 24-hour nursing care. Um, so that's that principle, really. And there's other kind of variations within that. Um, it's about having it cause the least amount of distress, etc. So in terms of reach, who does this actually apply to? It's really difficult to estimate figures because capacity can fluctuate. And we look at some of the conditions in a moment, you will recognize that some of them are actually reversible. Some of them have a good recovery rate. So any figure that we have is only a snapshot of that, that point in time, really. Um, we've got some figures from July 2022, um, which indicated that probably about 2 million people lacked capacity through various conditions and diseases or disabilities um, and the things that it could apply to um, certainly this is not exhaustive stroke brain injury psychiatric disorder learning disability dementia delirium even confusion drowsiness unconsciousness that's secondary to illness or treatment um, substance misuse um, either through acute intoxication or withdrawal but again, bring it back to that principle. Just because they've got dementia or an, a learning disability doesn't mean they automatically lack capacity. And I think you can kind of group these together. You know, something like an LD, when someone gets to, you know, a teenage adult, you probably have a snapshot of what their cognitive ability is going to look like for the rest of their lives. Something like a psychiatric disorder, you know, with good care and treatment, that will get better. Um, dementia is going to get gradually worse. And again, stroke and brain injury, it's a real mixed bag. Some people have a hugely, um, you know, back to baseline recovery, whereas some people are left in an almost permanently um, impaired state. So that's why it's so important that all of this is applied on a case by case basis. So how do we assess capacity? It's something that scares a lot of people. A lot of healthcare professionals think they are not qualified to do it. I think there's an old fashioned idea around that that's for the consultant, that's for the doctor to do. Um, but really anyone who is kind of got a bit of training, is qualified, understands the intervention that is to be carried out, could do a capacity assessment. Um, and the way that we do that is very formulaic and de derived from the law. So for us to even get to the point of, of questioning a decision or imposing a decision, 
we need to ask two things. So in the first instance, does the person have an impairment of the mind or the brain? And that could be a, as a result of illness, disability, or even temporary kind of intoxication, like we mentioned. Um, so that's the very, very first thing to establish. Um, and if they don't, if it's kind of a negative response to one of them, then they've got capacity. Um, there's got to be something going on that's going to be affecting their mind or brain. The next kind of, I, I suppose, stage of this, or you, you tend to consider them both at the same time. But if such an impairment does exist, and remember, we're not making any assumptions just because someone's got a, a specific diagnosis. Is that impairment currently so serious or severe that they're unable to make a specific decision? So this isn't about global lack of capacity. This is this person is going along through an episode of care, admission, whatever, and there suddenly becomes a point where a decision needs to be made about care or treatment. I think it's really important as well to remember that capacity can fluctuate um, and people should always be supported to regain capacity, you know, wherever possible. So if you assess someone as lacking capacity, but you know they are acutely unwell with sepsis, it would be absolutely ridiculous to make arrangements to have them put in a nursing home. So always think, is this urgent? Is it an emergency? Can this decision be delayed? And when it's to do with things like finances, housing, um, that's when you really want to be delaying that and going through a really formal best interest process. Um, of course, uh, a medical emergency is different. You, you know, you've got the right to treat that just with the general capacity. Act. We're not really thinking about dolls or anything if it's an emergency. Um, and you're also supported by common law um, in places like a &E as well. So getting back to your two-stage two test, if you've worked through that, and it's kind of a positive response. They've got an impairment and it's quite serious at the moment. We need to check um, the person's understanding against four main criteria. And again, just to reiterate, just because you've got dementia doesn't mean you automatically lack capacity. And the MCA, the code of practice is super clear. A person is really defined as being able to un unable to make their decision if they cannot do one or more of the following things. So they cannot understand the information you've given to them to support them making that decision. If they cannot retain that information long enough to be able to make the decision. Um, if they cannot weigh up the information available to make the decision, you know, if they can't kind of reiterate the pros and cons of having or not having the treatment. Um, and if they cannot communicate the decision. Now, this one's really important. We need to maximize people's communication. So think about language barriers. Um, think about sign language, writing things down. You know, you've got these very rare, but, um, you know, awful conditions like locked in syndrome, for example. The, the person is completely cognitively intact, but they may not be able to move, you know, anything from, gosh, the eyes down. So even communicating through blinking, tapping, you know, things like that. I know these are quite rare and unusual um, scenarios, but, you know, if there is a way that we can support someone to communicate, however that is, we need to be doing that. Um, and the thing, the retention one is quite an easy one to test. Um, you know, a lot of people with dementia present superficially very well. Um, they're able to sort of talk the talk, get along okay in social situations, say the right things, confabulate, go away for 10 minutes, you know, do your round, go and see your next patient, do whatever. And if you come back and you can then check their memory, check their retention. Um, and if they're still there, you know, pleasantly saying hello, but they've got no memory of what you've just talked about, very strong indication that they perhaps don't have capacity to make that decision. Um, but again, it's all about maximizing, giving people lots of opportunities um, to do that when it's not in an emergency setting. So briefly mentioned that, you know, in terms of who should assess capacity, um, anyone can do so if they are kind of trained and qualified. And when I say trained and qualified, there's no certification 
you know, in my clinical role, it was just something that I developed into. I would perhaps have done some with support from my consultant psychiatrist. But if it was a decision or a, an intervention that I was proposing, it would be my responsibility um, to assess that capacity. Really, you want the decision maker to be the person assessing capacity. And the reason for that is that the person who's undertaking the procedure is in the best position to explain the risks and the benefits of that. Um, it's not something that you can readily outsource to psychiatry. And I know I kind of reflect on some of the, the gripes I had from working in you know, mental health liaison. We would get so many referrals. Can you come and assess this person's capacity? And we would go and it might have been that, you know, person had psychosis 20 years ago, but the surgeon wants to cut off their leg. It's not the place of the mental health team to explain what, you know, why you need an amputation, why you need your leg cut off. We can support we can maybe give an independent um, assessment or kind of review to say, right, actually, they're not acutely psychotic. There's nothing going on here that's going to affect their decision making. Perhaps give a, a bit of a, a, an assistance that way. Um, but certainly the kind of wholesale delegation um, to capacity assessment, it, it just can't be handed over. I'll always remember one of the psychiatrists that I worked with um, he said putting mental in Mental Capacity Act was one of the least helpful things the government could have done because in so many people's mind, that link with mental capacity and mental health um, was so explicit. And if you remember my previous section on legislation, in mental health, we rarely use the MCA because we've got the Mental Health Act, which kind of trumps that. It covers detention. It covers um, getting people into hospital. It covers treatment majority of times i'd say nine times out of ten that the mca is deployed it's for the treatment of a physical disorder and i think there are some gaps even within senior consultants knowledge about how to effectively undertake um, a capacity assessment so just revisiting this principle from before so you've worked through those steps and you've reached the decision where a person lacks capacity any decision that you make for that person must be in their best interest. Um, so what really that is, it's, it's a decision that's, you know, in their best interest. It's not going to cause them any harm. Um, it's maybe for their own good. Um, it's maybe something that they don't understand that would be very beneficial to them. Um, within that, you should involve the person as much as possible. Um, you want to take on board the views of family and friends. What was important to that person in the past? You know, if, if someone's got dementia and they're quite far advanced, family members can be really good um, in informing uh, a best interest decision. Um, we always want to incorporate people's wishes, beliefs and values. We obviously want to avoid discrimination. I think that goes without saying. Um, and we want to find the least restrictive option as well, you know, and, and that comes down to giving their, giving people choice when they don't really have a choice can still be really important. You know, I've worked with lots of people who have been psychotic, um, they've needed medication, they don't want it, but that doesn't mean that we just kind of restrain and inject them and that's it, we've got the power, you don't. You can explain to someone, look, you need this medication, you're going to be given it, but why don't we look at the side effect profile of each one? And at least you've got a choice then within the cage that kind of healthcare services have placed you in. So there's always ways to make people feel um, a little bit more involved. So we'll come on now to dolls. Um, I suppose this would have been the LPS section had it been brought into play. Um, but as I mentioned before, the DOLS is a legal process or mechanism within uh, the Capacity Act. And it's really the thing within the Act that provides the power to deprive people of their liberty in hospital and care home settings. Um, and case law established a really important acid test um, to determine if someone is being deprived of their liberty. Um, and an acid test is just something that you can do in the field to check something out um, against a piece of legislation. Laws do tend to be quite vague. Um, they're often not 
designed to be overly prescriptive. And this is why our understanding develops through case law and things that get brought to the Court of Appeal. Um, but the case in question uh, was one, it's known as the Cheshire West case, uh, which is quite near us in Manchester. Um, and that was heard in the UK Supreme Court in 2014. Um, and that was a landmark case that really helped to develop the definition of what is meant by deprivation of liberty. Um, not got enough time to go into it, but if you want to get some more context, it involved um, uh, an LD boy, a boy with LD, um, whose mother brought a case against uh, what she felt was deprivation of liberty. Um, so do give that a little, uh, little Google. Um, it's quite interesting to see how we got to where we are. Um, and so that acid test, um, does the person lack capacity to consent? Um, is the person subject to continuous supervision and control? Um, so we're thinking there, you know, hospitals and care home settings. Um, if you are in a place where the staff always have a rough idea where you are, you're under continuous supervision and control. Um, and the kind of the last part of the acid test is, is that person free to leave permanently? Now, this one's really interesting because it's not based on whether or not the person's trying to leave. It's based on the hypothetical reaction of staff if that person attempted to leave, even if they're not. So that could apply to someone who, again, go back to dementia as an example. They might be in a care home. Uh, they might be very, very far advanced that they've no real bearing of where they are. But they would meet this test because they don't have capacity. They're subject to continuous supervision. And the dementia is so severe that they would be such a risk to themselves to leave the property. So it's about what staff would do um, if that person attempted to go. So in this case, a dolls would still need to be in place. Um, the dolls, as we'll look at in a wee bit more detail, gives you the power to prevent someone from leaving and also just as the authorization in general for them to be in that authorized place. Um, so I've kind of said that I gave my case study away uh, too early. But if we think about a 92 year old woman uh, with advanced vascular dementia, um, she's in a nursing home. She's got OK mobility. She has a little wander about. But she's pretty nonverbal. She's reliant on staff for most done interventions, completely unaware. Uh, where she is. So she would require a dose. Um, again, it's a moot point, really, but this lady would probably be subject to continuous back to back dolls. Um, there would have been one initial capacity assessment um, that covered her transfer from hospital, her home into this residential place. Um, and then the dolls is just kind of reauthorized year after year um, for something like dementia, anyway, that's only going to get worse. So these are just some of the legal terms that you might come across. It's a little bit dry. I won't linger on it. <clears throat> um, the managing authority is the body responsible for providing the care or treatment. So realistically, this is going to be the hospital trust or the care home provider. Um, and they must apply to the supervisory body if they want to deprive someone of their liberty. And to do so, they would uh, put through what's called a standard authorization. Um, the supervisory body will always be the local authority, so the borough, Manchester City Council, Stockport Council, whoever, other councils are available. Um, and they've got 21 days to decide if a dolls is kind of legal or warranted. Um, now, they are supposed to appoint assessors to review cases and ensure that conditions are met, make sure that decisions are being kind of upheld in people's best interest. I know there's a massive backlog. Um, you know, people take up kind of agency work as a best interest assessor because councils are just so desperate to get through the backlog. Um, and a big part of what the LPS was going to do was reduce some of that bureaucracy. Um, but we still have an awful lot of kind of outstanding assessments. Um, <laughs> they will authorise the dolls. Um, and they can be valid for up to one year, um, and they will set the terms of that standard authorization. Important as well, if someone regains capacity after three months, 
the dolls is voided. We don't just keep someone on that um, just because the paperwork tells us to. Um, and another concept as well is that of the emergency authorization. Um, so hospitals can kind of self-certify for seven days. So if they're having to treat someone um, and keep them on, on maybe an acute ward, for example, um, they can self-certify for seven days and then they would kind of put in their standard authorization. An awful lot of the time people are kind of turned around and perhaps after that seven days, they've regained enough capacity to make the decision. Um, I think as well, sort of anecdotally, I don't think I don't think every instance that needs to be done is always done. I think sometimes it is such a bu bureaucratic process that if you can get someone treated and turned around within a couple of days, it may not have even you know crossed the mind to, to fill in that paperwork and they're already better. Get asked this a lot, I think it even came up in the last uh, webinar, but a dolls doesn't actually authorize any compulsory treatment. Um, often got asked on the ward, right, there are dolls, we can treat them now. Doesn't work like that. The dolls is simply the authorization that permits us to keep someone under supervision. So the dolls covers them being in hospital or a care home against their will, um, but it doesn't let us kind of do any interventions. Um, so any kind of subsequent intervention, we would consider using the Mental Capacity Act and that best interest approach, and we would work through that checklist again. Obviously, it's kind of hand in hand, you know, the dolls, as I said, is a mechanism within the MCA. So for the dolls to be authorised, you will have um, completed a capacity assessment in the first instance, the threshold for the dolls is really quite high. So it's, you know, it's fairly likely that they're also going to lack capacity um, for the treatment that they need to be there. And that's the one way to think about it. The dolls is about why they need to be there in that specific building. And the MCA is about the intervention which is required while they are there. Um, and all of these assessments are time and decision specific. So I'm just going to work through a bit of a case study, getting to the end now, just to hopefully bring this to life. I know it's quite complex. Um, and again, you know, a 40 minute webinar isn't going to consolidate all of this. Um, you will build on this through practice, through getting involved. There's no way that I could do the whole piece of legislation justice. So it has been a whistle stop tour. Um, but hopefully this example um, brings some of the concepts to life. So if we take John, He's 72, he's got dementia, um, lives at home normally, he's got a package of care three times a day, but he's become increasingly muddled. He's leaving the gas on um, and things kind of go from bad to worse when he has a fall, hits his head and is admitted to hospital. So in hospital, he's even more muddled following this fall um, and he's also really quite drowsy from the analgesia. I think the main decision that needs to be made in the first instance is we need a CT. We need to scan his head to make sure that he's not bleeding. And that's what the doctor's worried about. So he seems unable to consent. But if we work through it kind of formulaically, um, this is fairly urgent. It's unclear how long John's going to be out of the game for. You know, it could well be that if he is bleeding, that's causing the drowsiness, in which case it's not appropriate to delay things because he might not get better if we delay. So we're kind of weighing up there. You know, this isn't about long-term accommodation. This isn't about finance. This is about fairly urgent treatment. So from this, we've got justification to assess capacity. Um, there's a decision, a specific decision that needs to be made, which he's unable to make. And he does have an impairment of the brain or the mind. Now, Remember, this doesn't automatically need to be about the dementia. In this case, the drowsiness um, is sufficient justification in the circumstances. I think this would be the exact same process if you took someone that was 30 but came in from a car crash who didn't have um, a diagnosis of dementia. You'd still be working um, on the basis of impaired or reduced decision-making ability. Um, so as he's so drowsy, 
it's almost a, a slam dunk. He's not got capacity. He's unable to understand what you're even proposing. He can't retain it. He clearly doesn't have the ability to weigh up the risks of not having this CT. So we've got really sufficient grounds here to document that he lacks capacity. Obviously, good practice is to consult family, make it a best interest decision, but that's not always possible in an emergency. Um, but I don't think anyone could argue that to not give this, it would not be in his best interests. We're also not suggesting anything that's overly restrictive. You know, it's not like we have to take his skull off and poke about in his brain, mine a bit of radiation from the CT. That's about the extent of it. Um, potentially massive gains if we're able to spot a bleed on the back of that. So I think this is probably the least restrictive um, for what we want to achieve. Good news. So he's not bleeding, but what we're finding is that he is recovering quite slowly. It becomes less drowsy because he needs less pain medication. But what we're left with is a kind of problematic behavior. He's even more muddled, maybe a wee bit aggressive. He's distressed. He's acutely confused. He's wandering around and he's trying to leave, but he's not yet medically fit. So what do we think? Is the patient being deprived of his liberty? I mean, given that this is a seminar on deprivation of liberty, we can assume that he does, that he is. Um, so he's, he's kind of lacking capacity. We've established that he is subject to continuous supervision and he's not free to leave. I think we'd have to intervene. Um, so we've got kind of justification there to submit that dolls and have that authorized. But we've got a little plot twist. So from the scenario, it probably seemed inevitable that that was a downward trend, probably seemed inevitable that the patient was heading towards 24 hour care. But we get some information in from family and it turns out that John's dementia is actually relatively mild. He's only been diagnosed in the past three to six months. Um, and what we get from a collateral history is that those behavior changes at home were very, very acute. Um, and perhaps what has transpired that in the initial rush, the excitement to, you know, try and find a bleed and, and save his life, maybe we've missed that actually John's got a delirium and that's what's impacting, that's what's causing his current presentation. So we can resolve that, give him a little bit of time, get rid of those kind of uh, factors that might be contributing to his delirium and get him back to baseline. And so the outcome of this is that John regained capacity. The underlying cause of the delirium was investigated. It was a UTI. We got a management plan in place with the GP. Package of care was slightly tweaked to meet his updated news uh, needs. But John was able to return home and live an independent life with mild dementia for many years. Now, this is this case study is an amalgamation of lots of people. It's not one person's story, um, but it's something that I put together from kind of years and years working in liaison. And if you remember last time when we spoke about organic psychosis, one of the things that I said was so important is just giving people time to recover. With delirium, one of the things that happens is that people remain delirious well after the markers have come back down to zero. So if you've got a kind of a medic who they're very kind of results and algorithm driven at times, you know, we had lots of people on the phone, right? CRPs back to zero, the medically fit, but they're still weird. It's your job. But actually this delirium lingers. And I think this cautionary tale illustrate some key principles you know delirium is chronically unrecognized underdiagnosed and in this case dementia was the red herring you know john is he's going to get worse but in this case study that dementia was really new really mild and it was a complete kind of misrepresentation of what was happening delirium was temporary and it was reversible but if we didn't fully investigate that there's every chance that that could have gone to a formal capacity assessment. He's not safe to go home. He's leaving the gas on, you know, lots of red flags, social workers sweating buckets because they're worried about the neighborhood going up in flames. That could have been a very different outcome to that best interest um, assessment or decision 
And then all we've done is popped an old vulnerable man into care with a raging UTI and consequences of delirium. So time is so important and ruling out kind of every, um, every possible alternative. And this idea of diagnostic overshadowing um, is really, really important. So I'm going to know we're a bit short on time. Very, very quick um, overview. And again, this could all change. Do not commit this to memory. Do not write it down. Um, no one should be changing the practice as a result of that. Um, but the main differences between DOLS and LPS, LPS was going to be seen as a slight improvement. Um, one of the limitations of a DOLS is that it needs a new application every 12 months from scratch. Now, initially, that was to safeguard people from being detained indefinitely, but it caused an awful lot of work of people having to do applications from scratch for people with long-term dementia that was only getting worse. So with the LPS, the idea was that they could be renewed for up to three years at a time using existing um, information that you already held. Um, Dolls are currently only for people 18 and over. Um, so the court of protection is required for people 16 to 17. Um, a limitation as well, all of this sits with the local authority and they are not always best placed to oversee hospital decisions. Um, <clears throat> so the idea of the LPS um, was that there would be much more local authorization. So hospital trusts would then be responsible for managing and doing the best interests assessment on their patients, on their decisions. Um, and there was also going to be an implementation of kind of portability. Um, so at the minute, if you were in a care home, but then needed to be transferred to hospital, you'd need a new dolls for that new episode of care. But the LPS was going to allow sort of respite planned admissions to be covered under the one application. But again, you don't know if that's going to happen. And if LPS does get uh, brought back to life, it may well look completely different. Just a whistle stop tour, kind of coming on to the last slides now. Um, Mental Capacity Act versus Mental Health Act. The Mental Health Act always trumps the Capacity Act. Um, the Mental Health Act can be used on people who have capacity. So many people that are detained under the MHA will lack capacity, but we can detain people, maybe they're depressed, really suicidal, um, but maybe don't meet that threshold for lacking capacity. But because they have depression and are at a significant risk, we can detain and then treat them. Um, with the Mental Health Act, you can also enforce compulsory treatment as well. So that's what makes it different. It's kind of like the Mental Health Act it, it covers treatment, whereas the DOLS doesn't cover the treatment. Um, I know that's a, a really doesn't do the topic justice, but do go back and watch the previous webinar um, because that, that makes it a lot more uh, transparent. So just in a summary, remember those five principles. If you stick with them, you can't really go wrong. Um, best interests, always remember time and decision specific. Never make a referral. Never ask someone to come and see someone who doesn't have capacity without saying what for. No assumptions. Remember that little case study. Always work through your two-stage test. Always be checking, retaining, understanding. Maximize that decision-making. Dolls is not a license to do what you want to patients. Um, and just to reiterate as well, so I'm not legally liable for something awful, there are no changes to practice as yet as per the LPS, but do watch this space. Um, as always, happy now to take a few questions um, and you're welcome to give us a wee follow on Twitter as well.